So the next thing we're going to check out that someone forwarded me was this video from the professor. I am going to quickly Okay, that's actually pretty good. I was gonna recrop it, but I think we're good. Look at this face. Look at this face from the professor. He is unpleased with whatever he's going to say. Let's let's check it out. In Magic the Gathering, preview season never ends. There's always a new set to begin spoiling, a new pre Okay, this is something that people talk about all the time, especially in the Magic the Gathering uh, community, is that there's always... We're still playing one set, we're still having fun with one thing, and then um, content creators, uh, people in the Magic community, people who work at Wizards of the Coast, are already starting to talk about the next set. And I think that that is a, an area of fatigue for Magic fans and Magic players. And I think that that's something that Wizards of the Coast should really work work on, so. Precon deck to post, a new product to purchase, one after another after yet another, until it begins to feel like an endless barrage. And by the way, that's not just a perception. We can look at actual data to show just how much the Magic the Gathering product machine mm -hmm. has ramped up. Yep. Since we are returning to oh, Innistrad this got graphs. fall, I feel it is only fitting to Professor's compare given 2021 us data. to the year, oh. the year of Innistrad's original release. In 2011, excluding digital products, Magic the Gathering released okay, 10 we got products, graphs, including the brand new Commander pre-constructed. Okay, so in 2011, there was 10 products. Decks. If we were to break down those commander decks, as well as each magic set of that year, into its individual components, in other words, count each commander deck as a separate product, count the various ways you could buy Mirrodin Besieged, New Phyrexia, M12, and Innistrad, i.e. Fat Pack, Intro Deck, Event Deck, etc., then by my math, we would have a total of 38 products. Okay. Now, 38 products in a calendar year doesn't seem like a whole lot. And I think that that's why the professor is bringing this up now, because 10 sets with 38 products in a year doesn't feel like a lot of fatigue. I think at the general cost of these things being $50 or below, you're looking at um, most Magic players being able to buy 38 different products every year. And so I think that's, that's, that's a good stat to pull up that you could have bought in 2011. Again, this is if you bought one of every intro pack, one of every commander precon, etc. Compared mm -hmm. to last year, 2020, excluding uh -oh. digital products, Magic the Gathering released 34 products, more than triple the 10 products released in 2011. If we were to break down 2020's products into its individual components, again, as if we were buying one of each set, bundle, commander deck, etc., there would have been a total of 67 products in 2020. Okay, so going back to the Mark Rosewater year in design thing that we just uh, read through here on the stream, this, this is... I think this is overcompensation. I'm not sure. I would love to see what 2019, 2018 looks like because I think that they overcompensated for the state of the world and started ramping things up because they wanted more people to experience magic in a time where we were all going through some negative shit. Um, we all needed more hobbies and more things to do around the house. They wanted to bring people together. They also wanted to make more sales. We can't forget that this is a consumer product. This is a consumer market. And they have to, have to, have to, have to focus on making more sales. Magic doesn't survive if they're not worried about sales. And in a year where everything looked like it was turning to shit, Magic had record sales, and they also had an incredibly large amount of releases. So I think those two things coincide um, more than more than maybe we think, and I think that the reason for that is, is an overcompensation from the product team, from the design teams, uh, from everybody at Wizards of the Coast. I think it was full panic mode like a lot of businesses went into and it obviously worked because it broke a lot of records 
Yes, that includes secret layers, of which there were 15. So far in 2021, if we count what has been announced for the upcoming Dual Innistrad sets, we are at a total of 56 individual products. Keep in mind the year is far from over, and I think it is fair to say we will at least meet the number of 2020, if not exceed it. So what's the problem here? After all, it's all selling. Each year Hasbro reports Wizards of the Coast is not just profitable, but extremely profitable. Yep. It's record sales That's and record earnings. So in other words, the product is selling. If it's selling, doesn't that mean it's successful? Doesn't that mean they should keep making it, keep producing it Not as necessarily. long as we buy it? I don't know. If I started making drama-chasing, trashy videos that got views in the millions instead of uh -oh. just hundreds of thousands, would that mean I was producing successful this video videos? This video has exactly would over 100,000, just barely. Them? Now, I'm not saying Wizards of the Coast is making a trash product, but in this video, I would like to argue that it's maybe not as good, both in quality and overall enjoyment, as it used to be. And I will link that to this oversaturation of product. Okay, I just want to say that as a lot of my opinions on this video or this um, line of thinking from the professor is going to be slightly divisive, um, but also um, more combative towards his opinion because I'm new. I don't feel the burnout that a lot of content creators are talking about on Twitter and Twitch and YouTube. I don't feel a lot of um, remorse for th and, and praise for the way it used to be because I'm not super familiar with the way it used to be even when i was a teenager and i played magic the gathering we're talking about me as an ignorant kid not going to the lgs but rather picking up random cards here and there and building a deck and never playing with anything else and so my familiarity with their um, release schedule and the oversaturation of the market isn't something that is going to necessarily align with the professors here and i chalk that up to simply because I'm far newer here than than he is, uh, where I have less data and stuff gathered already to go on. But we're just going to continue watching. This constant preview season, this Magic the Gathering overload. But before we begin, a quick word about this. Okay. This video, this video is sponsored by Keeps, a subscription men's health brand. This is just a tool that for... Cool. Do happen to be ready... Advertise um, keeps. Slash Let's do keeps. God, I love that logo. As always, with discussions such as these, I ask mm -hmm. only that you acknowledge my claims, however much you may Ooh, disagree with that tie. them, are and nonetheless jacket. sincere and not motivated by anything other than a love for and opinion on this game. I will always strive to offer evidence for my inferences and conclusions. Good. My argument is not professor. that we have seen an incredible increase in Magic the Gathering products. That much is demonstrable. My argument Ooh, is that this increase is Good having word. negative as well as possible positive effects upon the game. Let's start with the Okay, but well, actually no, positive. let's watch let's the hear first his positive. positive is that it's making a lot of money. Yay, capitalism. Sorry, Spice 8 Rack, but the corporation making money is great. It means that our game is going to continue to be made, that funding and resources are available just for called out maintaining Spice 8 Rack. the game and expanding it. Even if you disagree with how the corporation is allocating all that money, at least it's available, and that goes a long way to ensuring the future of the game versus a company that is not making money and facing tough choices about how or even whether they can continue. Another positive is that by offering more products, Wizards of the Coast can cast a wider net in terms of the audience for those products. This is exactly what I'm talking about. So as someone who, who just got here, let's use that as a phrase, I just got here. I'm excited about everything that's going on, everything that just went on, and everything that's coming. And as someone who is new, I 
don't have a lot of negative opinion or reaction to stuff like preview sets, pre preview cards, um, streams talking about sets that are coming in four months because I'm, I am ready to go. I'm fucking wallet open, praise be damned, like I am in it and I am stoked on the new stuff. I... I think that them trying to do different things as far as putting out that many products. W sorry, when you put out that many products, you uh, open yourself up to the opportunity to try more things. And I don't know that we get an AFR D&D &D crossover if they weren't willing to try more things. And that being said, if we don't get an AFR crossover and we don't do the D&D &D damn thing, then I don't know if I'm making magic content right now or loving magic and in this last year these last 12 months have been 12 months plus now it's august have been absolutely brutal for so many people um in including myself and those that i care about and love and have around me and so to think about the impact that this card game collecting these cardboard pieces has had on my life and my sanity and my attention span over the last few months that I've been fully immersed in it is, is monumental. I'm, I don't want to get too sentimental or teary eyed about it, but I don't, I don't know what I would have done without something like this to get obsessed over. And I'm always going to have a special place in my heart for magic because of that. And that's all circumstantial. So it's maybe not the best argument to be made against a conversation like Magic the Gathering Overload and Saturation. But I feel that sentiment every time I look at my cards, every time I'm playing Magic with my partner, and every time I'm learning new things or meeting new Magic creators, I... I can't help but get sentimental because I'm an empath and have been struggling this last year to focus my brain and my hands and my thought process. So magic has done so much for me in that sense that I, I'm never going to see it as an overload. And I apologize to the professor for rambling so much over this video, but I think that um, I just want to set the standard and expectation that... I am almost going to flat out disagree with much of the negative aspects of this overload and saturation of the market. So um, let's continue to watch before I start to cry. Well, every single product may not appeal to me and my needs as a player, them creating a giant plethora of products might increase the chances that a lot, not all, but a lot will indeed appeal to me. True. And it can be argued that with a smaller product line, there is less chance that something, everything, is going to appeal to me versus a large product line. I've heard that particular argument a lot, and I do want to offer a counterpoint, which is that this is only true if there is a great variety of products. Because if the increase is just them making more and more of what they already have, such as 15 commander decks versus five, such as three different booster packs of the same set versus one, general products versus specialty ones, then this argument is less valid. In that situation, it's something for everyone, mm. if everyone plays commander. Likewise, I feel the premise that more money means more expansion and growth for the game. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I think that he's talking about casting a wider net and making the more products you release the more people are going to be interested in at least one of your products and that goes back to that conversation about rosewater's state of design is that um you know there's not a single magic the gathering player on earth that's 100 percent happy or appealed by all of their products all of their game types all of the ways to interact and play magic the gathering and i think that sure going from 5 to 15 commander decks in a year makes it feel like those commander decks are less important or less unique than when it was boiled down to 5 but they're catering to the largest number of players who are 
statistically shown to be playing commander over other game types and tripling your commander deck output after gathering data and being shown that commander is the most popular format what you're trying to do is bring more people into commander and appeal to the people already playing commander so yes it is good that these products are coming out in multitudes because more people can get the commander standards that they don't already have or more people can experiment with commander pre-cons and the stuff as far as the different types of booster sets like people who play standard people who play um other game modes historic popper uh everything like you have all you need in those set boosters the set the sets of cards aren't aren't small numbers of cards there's hundreds of cards per set and no matter what kind of boosters you buy or what how many boosters you buy you're gonna find stuff that fits into all types of playstyles. and so i think that expanding the commander precons is a net positive because you're giving a particular audience of magic the gathering more resources more options more more design ideas because co conceptually that's what these pre-cons are it's magic the gathering designers and product makers creating mechanics creating these decks that work well together they're they're helping players who maybe aren't fantastic at brewing or don't find any joy in brewing they're giving them more and more variation in their gameplay in their deck choices in everything and so I think I wholeheartedly agree that, or disagree, that this wider array of products is is incessantly evil or negative, uh, downright, up, upright, downright, down, whatever. Um, I think that there's there's a lot to be said for for casting a wider net, and as a product maker and game designer, Wizards of the Coast is is doing the right thing with by going from five commander decks to 15 because that's 10 extra commander decks that you get to have 10 extra copies of of command tower and soul ring and, and and all these things that people love to collect and people love to play with and and they're hoping to get more people into playing this um game type of magic that is the most popular in the world right now doesn't apply if those funds aren't being directed into needed areas. Look at those product charts again. Critical question, has R&D, has the departments that design all these products increased to match the output of the products? In other words, since they are making what is arguably at least, if not more than, twice as many products as they did in 2011, have they hired the appropriate amount of new WOTC staff in those areas to match the new output mm, probably demand? Not. A few years ago, I actually asked several higher-ups at Wizards of the Coast that very question. I wanted to see if this was information that could be made public, and I was told, essentially, that for several reasons, it more or less could not be, and that's fair. I mean, generally, as a company starts to do better and release more products and, and make more money, they're going to be hiring more people. If you look at the WOTC job board, there's tons of jobs on there. Yet. Even though there's no clear way for us to know, I cannot help but feel that staff probably needed to increase their output much more than staff itself was increased. Again, no way of knowing, but in the same way I doubt that WOTC staff was given raises to match these record profits and their contributions as workers to those profits. That one's for you, Spice 8 Rack. I also doubt the company reinvested those profits into expanding game design significantly to match the growing demands. I guess a really good comparison is how Magic Arena was highly successful and we can only imagine highly profitable, but where did those resources go? Were those profits at least somewhat put back into making the client better? Well, I see 800 new cards being programmed into Arena to be sold through a highly questionable consumer unfriendly system, while the client itself still lacks resources to have basic things like a spectator mode, multiplayer capability, a functioning friends list that is anything more than a fractional implementation that was abandoned shortly after being tossed in. And I, I think I agree mostly with what the prof is saying here, although I do think he's oversimplifying 
and rightfully so for the sake of a, an 18 minute video he's oversimplifying the allocation of resources to um to content and design and development i having worked in numerous game studios i think that as as you scale up there's always going to feel like there's that bit of air between you and the lid and so as the lid of the studio moves up you gain more people and then as long as you maintain a balance where you're not overtaking that lid and overpaying for personnel and design and hours um generally those companies succeed a lot longer because they don't find themselves in debt and you have to continuously make something new that sells and does well in order to continuously build those numbers and and pump up the output and so i think there's just there's just a bit of oversimplification in this case because there's there's a lot going on um in the development of magic the gathering arena and and i'm not here to defend arena i don't think it's a perfect product and i really hate um numerous things about it and the way it interacts with my fandom of magic the gathering um i just think that it's it's a little purposefully negative maybe just cynical and i know the prof is a cynic and i love that about him um I just think it's a little cynical to think that they're not doing enough work on Arena when it's just evident that they're not doing the specific work that players are looking for. Uh, let's, let's continue. So forth and so on, but Arena is another video. Let's stick to paper. And let's stick to let's the consumer stick to paper. experience, because honestly, I can't guess at WotC motives, nor do I really care. I'd like to focus on results, and specifically the results for me as a player and customer. The biggest one is that ever since this explosion in product, I find myself more and more overwhelmed by constant releases and less and less able to keep track of it all, which leads to confusion, Fair. apathy, and disinterest. Now, I drew a lot of reasonable and valid criticism for botching okay. a- can we, can we talk about how amazing this hair is? Especially that he's talking about Innistrad. He looks like uh, a dapper werewolf. I would buy him a drink in a bar and uh, listen to his story. A few of my predictions for our return to return to Innistrad. Namely that I made a few predictions that were already disproven or just flat out uninformed and wrong based on information that had already been made available about Crimson Vow and Midnight Hunt. I'm gonna own that. That was my screw up. I'm not trying to brush off responsibility. I absolutely should have double, triple checked the information available before making my predictions. But I do think it is somewhat telling that a highly enfranchised Magic the Gathering content creator who lives, sleeps, breathes MTG was still essentially utterly confused about key details of an upcoming Magic product because fair. the details of magic products are constantly changing and also magic fair. products are constantly coming out and it's hard to keep it all straight without doing extensive research. There are just so many products and so much going on that we are bombarded with frequent hour-long streams, dozens if not hundreds of blogs, videos, articles, tweets, posts that I think it is very reasonable for the average player and even enfranchised ones to no longer feel confident in what exactly is going on at any given point. Okay, so, so I completely agree that not knowing what's going on as a content creator is frustrating and almost disingenuous to the point where I think Wizards should do a better job of communicating with their content creators, especially the completely enfranchised and the utterly beloved content creators like The Prof and MTG Girl and, and uh, Covert and all those big people that play um, magic and create content for their fans. I think they're pushing their product and, Mad and Wizards of the Coast should do a better job of building those relationships and um, you know back alley conversations where these content creators can get information ahead of time to help them make their content it's just that simple I do disagree though 
that the overwhelmingness comes from the amount of previews and blogs and and content that Wizards is making. As a company, they have to keep people interested. As a content creator and a writer, I know that you have to keep looking at the next thing in order to make fresh and new content. If if we're two weeks into Forgotten Realms and they're still publishing blog posts about Forgotten Realms and talking about a set that we know is going to be done in a few months, um, that feels negative and that's going to get a lot less views, a lot less clicks because once a set comes out, Magic the Gathering players are are so rabid and hungry for for learning and, and gathering all of this information that all of a sudden Wizards of the Coast aren't the experts in the situation they're they're playing behind they're they're playing a game that they're already losing because magic the gathering content creators and players and media personalities are so good so good at obsessing over the details that i wouldn't be surprised if they could easily correct Wizards of the Coast employees and content creators at Wizards of the Coast on information that they're trying to put out. And so as a content pipeline, that situation gets a little bit muddy and you have to uh, shorten the pipeline and make the pipe a lot smaller. So you're talking about having a set amount of time after the release of a set that's confusing having an allotted amount of time after the release of a set in order to talk about and make content for that set is something that has to be planned out in advance but so we're gonna give AFR two weeks we're gonna blow it up we're gonna talk about it every day a hundred tweets a day a blog post every day videos uh, Gavin Ver he's gonna do a million fucking things weird beard or not and and then once those two weeks are up, we're going to start talking about the next thing. Because we have to get people excited about the next thing. People are already inundated with this thing here. And we have to start talking about this thing that's coming. Because we want people to follow a carrot. And, and that might sound ugly or maybe disingenuine from their part. But that's how content creation works. That's how content works because you're trying to be ahead of the game. And as soon as the set is out and in the world, there's not a lot that Wizards of the Coast can do to make it sound like they're still playing from ahead of the pack because they're not going to be ahead of the pack. They have physical and literal jobs to do at their company that keeps them from being able to 100% obsess over something like the rest of us can. We can learn far more at a far more rapid speed about a set once it's out than anybody at Wizards of the Coast can. So I think that maybe the professor has a different type of content pipeline or, or maybe he is just focusing on a bit of the overwhelming feeling he gets from seeing all these blog posts and, and teases and card leaks and stuff like that. But as far as from the Wizards of the Coast standpoint goes, there has to be a set time that we give the attention to the current realm we're in before we move on to the next one. And they've probably done a ton of research on what that window looks like when people stop caring about the content they're putting out for the current set and that's when they have to start immediately going after the next one the only reason why we're talking about two sets ahead is because the next set is kind of a double set so for the rest of the fall we're going to get two Innistrad sets and so it's easy to talk about Crimson Vow even though that's not until November because it sort of has something to do with Midnight Hunt which is coming out in September and I just hope that, uh, you know, people don't feel disenfranchised about that or disgruntled about that because there's, there's a lot that goes into the content creation pipeline, especially at a company like Wizards of the Coast or a video game company or, or, or anything really. It's, it's very difficult to, it's very difficult to stay ahead of the game when it comes to 
your obsessive fan base and I'd be hard pressed to find a more obsessive fan base than those that uh, like Magic the Gathering. And even with all of those sources of information, Magic Overload seems to result in more and more uninformed customers. What's happening in Magic's story, for example? Can you name the 10 realms of Kaldheim and their characteristics? You know, when original Ravnica no, and then later Return to Ravnica blocks came out, we spent an entire year on the plane savoring the flavor of all 10 guilds to the point that most players today can recognize each of the 10 guild symbols, tell you the personalities, colors, leaders, and other details of each of the 10 guilds. I mean, this is fair. This is, we're going back to that Mark Rosewater State of Design article again, but spending more time in these realms is something I want. It's something every player wants. It's something that helps inundate a fan base in a setting and a, a set of lore that ties all these cards together. So I'm completely on board with uh, this line of thinking. And do so with the type of joyful obsession that makes devoted. We spent a few months in Caltime, and it's a huge, players. huge realm. Yet, how many Magic players can tell you about Immerstrom and Not Bold? What their colors and characteristics are? They came out this year and yet i feel far fewer players could tell you about them than they could is it or demir and before you argue yeah well there have been many ravnica sets so it's more ingrained i still bet you more people know about the cons of tarkir and the shards of alara and both of those are old sets i don't know and what yet any they of had that a means. lasting <laughs> impact on the player base whereas kaldheim and most of the new sets coming out well Literally within a week, previews start up again. We're rushing on to the next thing. There's no time for anything to resonate. Right after Kaldheim, we were already moving on to... I'm not dunking on the best world building in recent memory. I'm showing evidence that the best world building in recent history was mishandled to the point most players missed it. Look at the numbers. Something went wrong, and it's not the design of the world. He's talking about his tweet, his poll, where... Most people didn't know that there was even 10 realms in Kaldheim. I didn't know there was 10 realms in Kaldheim. And Kaldheim is one of my favorite magic sets that I've experienced so far. So, the prof ain't wrong. Strixhaven and Commander Precon previews. Sorry, no. After Kaldheim was two secret layer drops, which had been announced before Kaldheim, I think. Uh, can you name the two secret layer drops that came out right after Kaldheim? And then it was Time Spiral Remastered. Followed by, was it four or five Challenger decks? Which, when I made my video on the Challenger decks, I had overwhelming comments that people didn't even know they had been released. And I bet many of you watching right now didn't even yes. know that Challenger decks were released this year, let alone are able to say were. what those decks were. I don't think I've seen and them in any that store. Was so. all this year. I've already talked about how no one knows what's in a promo pack anymore, and set, and collector, and even draft booster contents and breakdowns change somewhat Ooh, with video. every set or so. We are about to have an extra set in standard. I is that the new normal, or is this a spe oh. Sorry. special standard with one extra set in it, and then it's going to be the normal way, or does it work a different way from now on? Kaldheim had two commander decks, but Strixhaven had five, and D&D &D had four, but each of the two Innistrad commander sets will have two commander decks with them, but those two decks for each set will not cost the same as the two for Kaldheim. Got it? And next year, who knows? Okay, I super agree. I understand what, what the professor's talking about here. I don't... All of the stuff that I've said so far about the way Wizards of the Coast is releasing products and releasing more products, none of that is a negative to me. But having a confusing set and variable set numbers and products within those sets, that is confusing. I think there might be some uh, trial and error that's going on with Wizards of the Coast product team right now. I think they might even be a b testing some things did calheim's commander sell more even though there was only two of them or did strixhaven sell more even though there was five of them did people care about the afr commanders i think that they're trying to find the right numbers i hope okay i hope that they're trying to find the right numbers wizards
Please tell me you're trying to find the right numbers. Because you need to come up with a significant and proportionate standard for what comes out when a new set comes out. If you're going to do three different types of boosters, fuck it, fine. Do three different types of boosters. If you're going to do commander decks for every set, fuck it. Do commander decks for every set. If you're going to do a bundle and then a gift bundle, but the gift bundle doesn't come out until a week or two weeks after the normal bundle and the set releases, fuck it, do that too. But at least create a pattern where every set, people know what to expect. And I think, I think that's what the professor is trying to talk about. Just give us something we can expect. And if we can't expect it, then we're going to be on the balls of our feet, sitting on the edge of our chair, waiting for the shoe to drop. Give us, give us a set standard of products. Tell us how many sets or how many products are going to be in every set. And don't change it. Do four commanders for every set. Do two different bundles. Do three different booster packs. Make funny hats. I don't give a shit. Just make sure that if you release 10 sets in a year, all 10 of those sets have the same number of products. That makes it easy for us to expect. And that makes us, especially when you're talking about pre-releases and, and pre-ordering, that makes us know what to expect. And that's just good business, because when we know what to expect, we know what we're going to pick, and we don't have to wait until the last minute to find everything out. And I think that's what the professor's getting at. Just find the right number. People have found it easy to point at the time they released 17 oh, different versions of Teferi, Master of Time, which came out in M21, but I'd argue most cards now have half a dozen or so, <coughs> at least two to four okay, versions, well, our cards don't and all count, of this builds upon itself. It continues to be harder and harder to keep it all clear, think. let can alone where and how card? to get the various versions. Wait, can you play an art card? As soon as this is done, I'm going upstairs to check my art cards. I do not think it is good for the game if players don't know for certain what is in a set versus a draft versus a collector versus a go. VIP booster pack or even how many sets are coming out during a given period. Yep. Which yep. ones are standard? When so many products are coming out, 15 yep. commander decks in one year, double masters and commander masters are legends, and jumpstart and mystery boosters all in one year? This year, standard gets a full extra set. At a certain point, players are just gonna check out. Sales might be through the roof, but there is no way increased profits at this rate can possibly sustain themselves. And once it stops, once we stop buying, a huge factor will have been that it just reached the point where, where no one could follow it anymore and no one cared anymore, let alone could afford to keep up. And why True. should they? With organized play dismantled and a huge shift from the local game store to digital only, so much so that we're now adding digital only cards to Arena. Video on that coming out. Okay, I understand his cynicism here, but there's a lot more context than Wizards just deciding that physical in-person games are no longer a thing. We are in the middle of a pandemic and there's a lot of things that aren't safe to do in large groups and playing magic and getting heated and going to Vegas for a GP. That's, that stuff isn't necessarily safe yet. Especially not with the recent uptick in cases and spread. So I think there's, there's a little bit of context missing here. Soon, Kitchen Table Commander is more or less the only use for a lot of these new products. At the end of the day, there are a lot of ways to Because our kitchen table is the only safe place to go. It's just one of them. Yes, these products are selling for now. But if we take the attitude of, hey, come back when they stop selling and we'll deal with it then, it may be too late. I strongly believe the sales of today are tied greatly to the quality of yesterday. And that quality is sharply, noticeably diminished, which has grave implications it's a bit for savage. the sales of tomorrow. What we are seeing is essentially an emphasis on business efficiency above the player experience. 
all the things that made devoted mm, and I don't obsessed know if I agree with that. players totally. seems to have been stripped away. Organized play, quality magic story that mattered, world building that resonated, Friday night magic, promos you knew about and wanted to collect, sets you could collect without this explosion of half a dozen variants, mm. product after product after product until no one can keep up. The Magic the Gathering overload needs to be reined in. We need to feel confident and clear sure. about this game. I should be able to tell someone what is in a collector booster, a promo pack, what is on the list, how many commander decks come out a year and how much they will cost. I want worlds I can sink my teeth into, Agreed. imagine myself a part of, stories I have Cal invested time. in, game pieces prioritized over collector's pieces, organized play to aspire towards, a history to we build can't upon, do organized a customer play right experience now. that is more it's not viable, than just perpetual prof. hype with ever it's diminishing not. substance. But now I want to hear from you. Mm. You are, after all, the customer, and your voice is the most important. Do you... Okay. Well, that was a lot. I think, uh... I appreciate, appreciate the prof so much, and I have watched so much of his content over these last uh, short little while, getting reintroduced to magic and, and being re-obsessed with magic. Um... And there's a lot in this video that I disagreed with and a lot that I will echo. I think that putting an emphasis on world building and spending more time within those worlds is huge. I am the type of player that loves themes. I love the um, Ravnica guilds. I love the Strixhaven schools. I love putting titles and names and places and people, the types of people into this fucking game where we play cardboard cards it's just really really intricate crazy eights and yet i want a story and characters and art that inspires and excitement um and i so i agree with everything prof had to say about that and i wholeheartedly disagree with his uh negative reaction to the content pipeline and the content that wizards of the coast is putting out because i think that there's a lot of science and effort that goes into predicting and designing content that people want to see and that keeps things fresh. I agree that all of the sets need a predetermined number of packs, a predetermined number of different products and commander decks, whatever, and that the price should be the same for all of those across all the sets across the whole year. I shouldn't buy a commander deck in February that's cheaper than the commander deck I buy in November. It's, it doesn't make any sense. The cards aren't getting that much crazier to make, and whatever costs that they're recouping by this burgeoning sales of the last year and a bit, uh, they need to put into paying the, I'm assuming, more difficult or steep price to manufacture and ship. Um, and then as far as ragging on Wizards of the Coast for disintegrating um, in-person magic, it's, it's not the time. Right now is not good. Every time I go to my LGS, I'm wearing a mask. Everyone there's wearing a mask. There's only a handful of people in the store, and, and we talk about in-person events and how wizard-sanctioned events are slowly coming back, and all of these people who are acting like nobody else fucking matters is causing this virus to spread more, and now we're going to see another uptick this fall of cases, and that's just going to keep us from playing in-person magic I wouldn't be surprised if some of the other non-magic related events that are planned for this fall when we were supposed to reopen everything and everything was supposed to be fine again, I wouldn't be surprised if some of those things got cancelled. And I think it's disingenuous to argue that Wizards of the Coast doesn't care about these things, but focusing on these things right now and allocating time and effort and money, development money, into building in-person magic events is so beyond the scope of the problem that the world is having right now that it it just feels a little ignorant to 
to talk about that kind of thing and complain about that kind of thing. Obviously, they're focusing on digital because everyone's stuck at home and still playing digital magic. I would love for Arena to be a better product. I would love for Magic Online to be a better product. And I hope that they're continuing to develop and and build upon these foundations that they've already set. There's a million things I'd love to complain about in Magic Online, but the fact that Magic Online has kept me playing Magic is brilliant. I get to just queue up or challenge a random friend online, and I don't have to worry about going out in public or going to big events where I don't know if everyone's vaccinated. I don't know if everyone's going to wear a mask and follow the rules of decency. And so being able to play Magic Arena has literally saved my hobby because I can only convince my partner to play so much Magic with me. And so I need to obsess over it more than that. And Magic Arena is the best place to do it. Yes, I want it to be better. No, I don't think that Wizards of the Coast is ignoring in-person magic events because that's where the magic happens. Pardon my pun or innuendo or whatever you want. They know how palpable and important in-person magic events are. I promise you they know. And that's all I have to say on that. I think I'm going to go take a walk. I'm going to... Uh, use the washroom and I think I'm going to skip the next couple of things that I have on the reaction timeline and maybe we'll do those tomorrow if I find a moment to stream otherwise when we come back we are going to be playing some brawl on magic arena we'll stick around we're going to be playing some one-on-one -on -one commander and hopefully getting that win because there's a bunch of experience points on the line.